Welcome along to another House Planning Help, Google Plus Hangouts, and today it's on the topic of Passive House Standard versus Passive House Principles. Again, we've got, well, I think I might have failed slightly here today in that it's quite a biased group of people, or <laughs> well, that's what I'm expecting at least, we're going to find out. Uh, and also, mainly from the UK. I like to mix it up and get a few views from around the world, but that's okay. I'm in the UK, and you can comment wherever you are in the world. So we'll get stuck in, first of all, with some introductions. Adam, do you want to go first? Uh, yes, well, my name's Adam Dadabai. Um, I'm co-author of the Passive House Handbook and um, director of Passive House Homes, Passive House Store, uh, and also proprietor of Passive House Bed and Breakfast in South Devon, in the southwest of England. And Elrond? Yeah, I'm Elrond Burrell. I'm an associate at Architects, and uh, we deliver quite a lot of projects to the Passive House Standard and some of the first schools in the country to Passive House Standard. And finally, Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Fuster. Um, I got into this whole thing uh, having retrofitted my own house, not to Passive House Standard. Um, and um, I'm currently trying to um, get into helping other people retrofit their houses, but using passive, passive house uh, methodology. Um, oh, okay. So not necessarily the standard. Um, if possible, it'd be great. Uh, but I've found the methodology is just very, very helpful. Um, it's accurate, and uh, it, it's it's very useful for any level of retrofit. So, now. I thought it might be a good starting point. I know this is obviously <laughs> basic for us, but anyone else that's just engaging in this Hangout and watching us might be wondering, Passive House principles, Passive House standard, what the heck is this Passive House? So, Elrond, do you want to sum that up quickly, what the Passive House standard is? Um, okay. <laughs> Passive House standard is a standard which has been around for 20-odd 20, 20 years now, or maybe 25 years now, probably. Um, developed by originally by research by a Swedish building scientist Bo Edemson and a German building scientist uh, Wolfgang Feist and Wolfgang Feist went on to develop it into an actual standard from the research they did together and the standard sets out some um, very clear benchmarks for uh, internal comfort for the building so um, surface temperatures, internal temperatures, ventilation rates um, no drafts, these kind of things that make uh, a building comfortable to be inhabited, and then set some aside alongside that, set some bench, benchmarks for the amount of energy that could be consumed to achieve those um, those comfort criteria. So there's a, a benchmark for the primary energy consumption, that's the, the total amount of energy consumed by the building, and also the amount of energy required for either heating or cooling of that building in the in the process of providing that comfort also. Um, so it's a performance standard that have these criteria that must be met. Um, there's a methodology involved in achieving those, so you have to use the Passive House Planning Package to do the energy and comfort modelling. Um, and there's, there's various other different technical aspects of it, but that's probably the kind of basics of uh, what the standard encompasses. Um, and then sometimes people talk about the methodology or the principles of Passive House, which um, can mean a whole range of different things, but um, I would guess from what Eric was alluded to before, that in the kind of circumstances that those of us on the call are likely to talk about it, probably means following everything that you would do to go to Passive House standard and to get it certified, but possibly not achieving some of those benchmarks because of um, uh, some of the project constraints involved in the particular circumstances of the project. I was interested there that you mentioned passive house principles could have some different meanings. So, Adam, would you like to tell me what it means to you and why you went for a passive house standard, well, actually retrofit in the end? Uh, well, I think the, the problem with the term passive house principles is it's it hasn't there isn't a, a, a commonly understood definition, and I think it's used by people who maybe don't always know um, what passive house is, and therefore it tends to muddy the waters a bit. Um, uh, I, I prefer to always use the term method passive house methodology myself because then you t you are talking about a, a, you know a way that you you. Um, you do the design process. Um, it's uh, it's a little bit more rigorous and more precise than what it means to me. So, um, 
for example, it means using the PHP NG modeling software. It means designing thermal bridge free junctions and paying attention to air tightness. Um, whereas passive house principles might just mean passive solar to someone um, if, not, if they haven't come across and learned about the term passive house before. Um, so, yeah, that's my feeling. Could you have a building then that is actually, uh, it could be built with passive house principles, but be exactly the same as a passive house standard building next door? Um, it's, it's possible, yes. It's a person doing uh, the Passive House Principles project, you know, was, was using the methodology and, um, you know, understood what the, the, the Passive House standard was in terms of energy and comfort, um, then yes, it's possible, but unlikely. And you didn't say why you chose the Passive House standard? Um, well, we, I chose the Passive House standard um, partly because of the time, you know, we, we were quite, you know, we were one of the first projects in the UK and they, the Enerfit standard hadn't been... Um, codified at that point and um, we also li live in a mild part of the UK so it was easier to achieve than if we had been based in Herefordshire or Manchester or up in you know, um, Glasgow or somewhere and also <coughs> I, I um, wanted to set you know go for certification because it, it, it really it keeps everyone on their toes it, if you haven't done it before it, it really it's like an Appalachian control aid for wine you know, it means you are aiming for a defined standard, and if you don't have that as your target, I think you tend to, it, it just takes the edge off, off, off the quality somehow. But I wouldn't say that what I did is something that you'd necessarily want to replicate everywhere. Uh, we, we should really have done a new build, you know, in terms of money. We, we, with the VAT regime in the UK, you pay, uh, you pay VAT on all the construction costs at 20%. If you do a retrofit, if you're doing a new build, all the construction costs will be AT free, and that really skews um, the balance away from retrofit. I mean, if that VAT uh, playing field was a bit more level, uh, it would have probably been a, still a tiny bit more expensive if we, if we had built new, and with the knowledge certainly we have as a company now, we would have been able to build more cheaply, um, achieve the same thing. And 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 we you know we do have a few compromises in the house in terms of thermal bridging. Uh, in the, the floor wall junction, which is very difficult to avoid in a retrofit. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I could happily go on to a retrofit discussion, but I'm going to keep yes. it on Passive yeah. Outstanding for a moment and go across to Eric. <clears throat> Eric, what I find interesting is that you actually have tackled a project before you got into this as a profession and, and have taken this further. You did a self-build project. So maybe you could tell us about that and how far you took it when it came to energy efficiency. Yeah, well, I mean, I've um, I, I did my I live in a mid terrace house, um, and uh, when I did it, I had, was just reading uh, various books and uh, uh, websites like the Energy Saving Trust website, um, and just tried to get as much information as I could at the time. Um, and I didn't know about passive house principles at the time, um, but once I'd done my house, I realised that I was pretty much following. Um, the idea of a fabric first uh, methodology um, similar along those lines similar idea of trying to get air tightness but not doing it well enough and so on um, so yeah that's that, that's what I did at the time um, and I think if yeah uh, I did a retrofit last year which was based on uh, PHPP and where we spent a lot more energy into the air tightness side of things um, that's definitely something which um, I've learned having done my own house, which is not is as airtight as I could make it, but uh, it's not good enough, I don't think. Um, so did you set yourself an energy target then when you did your retrofit? No, no. I just had this huge list of things to do on the wall. Uh, I knew, and it sort of evolved over time, and then it became this huge project. I didn't buy the house with an idea to do a retrofit. It's just that once I started living in it and realized what a damp, dark hovel it was, um, I just needed to do stuff and knocking walls through, and then this came and then that came and then I finally had this huge th you know and then you every job you want to do it well and it just became this huge thing and then suddenly I, I put ventilation in and then I put this in and that in and, and then finally it's it's what it is um, so then I've actually modeled it retroactively um, as to what I knew it was before I bought it and what I've done to it and even then I've uh, it comes out of PHPP at around about 
um, 65% reduction in space heating, which is not bad. Um, but that's still assuming assuming an air test at an air tightness uh, pre and post. Um, I had an air test done in the middle, um, but you know it might not be entirely accurate, but some more or less. So it's you know. Um, I know that we're all very interested in trying to get that energy demand right down. But is there anything wrong in actually building a new house and saying, well, even if it comes out as three air changes per hour, this, that's fine. That's going to be okay. Anyone want to pick up on that? <clears throat> I think it depends which country you're in. I think in the UK where we're still, asphalt is still new and there's a big learning curve that um, all the people who work in the built environment are going through. Um, you could say yes, um, and also we're in a, in a our, the the regulatory regime that we live under here is is not really very supportive of of challenging energy standards. So you know everyone who's doing it is doing it um, to a certain extent against the flow that the, the, the powers that be would want us to be building, which is to build cheap and corporate. Um, so uh, I, 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 at the last Passive House conference in Aachen a few weeks ago, there was a very good slide um, by one of the speakers showing the total um, floor area of housing across the world globally to the mid-century. And, and of course, it's growing and as a population grows and as India and China in particular become wealthier, they're building a lot of new floor space. And if we don't actually build to the passive house standards for you know, and retrofit to NFIT and, and you know, ACB silver or you know, to that sort of level of performance, um, the overall energy and carbon demand from from the built environment is still going to grow. So we actually, in order to cut, bring it down to and to counterbalance the increase in floor area, we do need to really be pretty radical. But you know, real world, as um, Eric's I think saying. Um, it's very hard, you know. People have a, you know, they've paid a lot of money for a house in an overpriced, uh, um, overheated housing market on land that's very scarce and expensive, and then you're left with very little money at the end of that to actually improve the fabric. That's interesting in terms of how we overcome that and what we do in the future. But is the passive house standard really? It's trying to put the bar somewhere. Elrond, do you, do you think that's a fair point to, to say that it, it's trying to get everyone above a certain energy usage, energy target? Yeah, I think so. Because I think, I mean, the standard is a little bit, you could say the standard is arbitrary. You know, there's certain benchmarks which are set. And they make perfect sense in the um, climate and the economy of Germany that they were originally set in. So you could kind of take a view and say, well, that's a bit arbitrary, it works there, and therefore in different places we should have different standards and things should be a bit different. Um, but I think that, I think it just all becomes a bit too woolly if you do that. And actually having something which is a rigorous standard, which is achievable, and is demonstrated to be achievable in, you know, more or less any climate. You know, there's some very extreme climates where it's just not going to be practical, but most climates where most people around the world live, it is an achievable, although very ambitious target. And I think that, um, yeah, I think we I think we need something that's that ambitious, really, because the task we're facing in terms of climate change and in terms of what Adam's talking about with the increase in housing stock and floor area across the world is that, you know, we need something which is that ambitious. And I think that it's fine to... I think that it's fine to have that ambition and then work towards it and, and maybe fail sometimes because there are different project constraints that come into play on different projects. So um, I think, you know, in terms of the overall question that we talk about here about passive principles or passive standards kind of thing, that I think it's just important to be clear when communicating that if you're doing passive standards, you actually are doing a certified passive house, um, whatever type of building, wherever that might be. If you're not, then I would definitely go along the lines of talking about the way Adam does in terms of saying you're using the passive house methodology, but be clear in communicating as to actually what you're achieving. And um, I think, yeah, I think it's. So I think it is important to have something which is absolutely clear, black and white. This is what the standard is. This is if you achieve it or you don't. It's a pass or fail kind of thing. Um, but at the same time, okay, I think so that we don't necessarily expect everyone to do that. 
Look at what they're doing in America, and they seem to have gone off a, a bit on, on an extreme or part of, <laughs> I'm not even sure what, what the, the group is called, but in that case, they're taking it into their own hands and saying, well, it's better doing this. So if that happens in too many places, is that not a perfect case for passive house principles? We know it's the insulation, the air tightness, and the thermal bridging, all of these things, just, just do your best. Well, <laughs> yes and no, because actually, if you look at it, there are there are no things that you can actually define as passive house principles as such, because it's not um, it's not really a matter of principles; it's a matter of physics. Then it's a matter of actually getting that all to work coherently together as a comprehensive approach. So um, that's the, that's the problem with talking about principles in that sense that it just suddenly becomes completely open and nobody knows exactly what's being referred to. And I think, yes, there's a little bit of uh, kind of politics and manoeuvring and what have you going on with the Passivus Institute in the US, which have broken away and are not affiliated with the Passivus Institute in Germany, as, you know, like the Passivus um, Trust in the UK is affiliated with the Institute in Germany, etc. So there's a kind of, there's the International Passivus Institute and there's all the branches or affiliates with that. And then there's now this US thing, uh, US organisation, which is uh, pulled out separate. And they've kind of set their stand out really to say why they've done that and they feel that it's because of some of the particularities of the climate in some areas of the United States, they feel that economically, or at least my understanding of it, is that they feel economically that taking a different approach to the, the international pacifist standard actually makes as much sense financially to achieve the same kind of uh, comfort criteria and carbon reductions, um, which you know you can say that's you know it seems eminently reasonable on a lot of levels. It does kind of confuse the issue somewhat when people start talking about passive house standard. And I think personally that it would be somewhat better if they just renamed themselves something slightly different and just said you know this is what we are. It's different to the passive house standard and. You know, not not. It, it confuses. Just, it feels a bit confusing that it sounds so similar. Mm, that's right, because there are other. You know, there's the Super E standard in Canada, isn't there, which is not quite as, as demanding as Passive House, but it's got a separate name. The principles mm. are very similar, um, but it's. it's and in it's, Switzerland, there's the Minergy standard, which is actually on par with Passive House, um, and equally rigorous has equally rigorous methodology, and I would say. If anyone wants to design a building to the Minergy standard, it's absolutely as good as Passive House. Mm. It's less well known than Passive House because it's not made such an effort to kind of push yourself out there, I suspect. But um, you know, it's clear you're doing Minergy or you're doing Passive House, or in some cases, people do both. <laughs> you know, ambitious, <laughs> ambitious really people. Ambitious <laughs> people, doesn't it? If we've got them all going, do we think that this is actually going to get to the stage where it could become a dominant standard around the world? I think it has to, yeah, because the physics that's driving um, all of this in the end is that energy is becoming more expensive and ultimately more scarce, and climate change is becoming harder and harder to ignore. And so, you know, we are moving from a, a world where the, all the economics dr drove you towards profligate use of energy, you know, going back a hundred years ago in, in, in the, you know, the U.S. and the U.K., um, and to a world where if you're profligate in your use of energy, you, you you, you, you'll be poor, <laughs> so unless you're incredibly wealthy, for most people the economics will drive you towards uh, being um, uh, more thrifty in your end use and I think you know people aren't, most people aren't willing to go back to a kind of homespun form of thrift where you basically put up with very high levels of, of um, thermal discomfort, they want to live in a house that's comfortable, most people expect you know, the comfort that, that a modern centrally heated home can give you, um, or, or even better, you know, I mean, it's interesting with the B&B &B here, we do get a lot of feedback on what Passive House is like, and everyone is, is, is really excited about this is the next thing on beyond what we've all grown up with. Um, I think it's taken a very long time to get here as well, hasn't it? I did a recent podcast where it was mentioned that it, you often get a better climate in your car than you do in your house. Yes, it's true, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think that's I mean, true. I think the building industry really seriously lags on a lot of levels. I think the other thing which is 
which is really important to add to what Adam was saying about the cost side of things, is that more and more people are starting to realize that other standards which are available for housing and for other types of building, you know, any type of building construction really, other types of standards which offer some kind of mark of green credentials or energy efficiency or things are not offering the same kind of trustworthiness or the same kind of reassurance of actually delivering what they set out to deliver. And so, you know, there's been, um, well, it's possibly getting down a slight sidetrack, but there's been a number of cases in the press over the last few years pointing out various other green standards which purport to be better for the environment, better for using less energy, better for costs, better for the occupants, etc., but are actually actually failing on some of their own purported criteria to be better than the average kind of commercial build which is being compared against. Whereas you know, especially people in the industry that are involved in this side of things. I mean, that's why quite a few people that are really hot on passiveness now have come to that because they've tried other things, they've tried other standards, they've tried the ways of doing things which they think are the best ways, and they get so far and they just realise that actually it needs a rigorous standard, it needs a methodology to go through, and it needs some kind of benchmark to measure it against, which can be compared from one to another. You sold me, all definitely, you've sold me on the passive house standard, but I, I have to, <laughs> as we're running out of time, I have to bring in this element yeah. that I know a lot of people in our community are driven that way, but there might be others who would be more inclined to, say, reduce insulation and have a bit bigger floor area, or, and this might be an interesting point, uh, maybe Eric, you want to pick up on this, that if you're producing um, via passive house principles you can you can get more of the design you want you could just create the design and then put everything on afterwards is, is that a, a point that's worth making that um, you could just apply it all afterwards and, and we could keep creativity for designers or am I just trying to play devil's advocate here <laughs> I think you are <laughs> I don't know um, I think reality is that and you know I mean I'm you know, I'm gonna. I'm involved with with people who who may not have well, who don't have the money to go right to NFIT level. Um, but even out, even people's budgets are always going to be limited. It, a percentage of that budget is going to be used on non-energy efficiency stuff anyway. Fact. So you know, and the budget's going to be limited. Fact. So what do you tell people? Right. Well, don't bother doing it, anything. Or do you try to, you know, figure out how to help them do something to get to as better, best level as possible, the most cost-efficient way of using that money uh, to get as much carbon reduction as possible and to make the house as as comfortable as possible? So I think, you know, that whole the whole discussion is quite interesting in in terms of um, the the passive house standard, which which I think is really great. It's something that for new build definitely, I believe, needs to be done. Uh, I don't think you see any excuse to to not have you know, um, new new buildings constructed to some kind of standard like that. Um, but for retrofit, it's just very difficult because it costs so much more to to make an old building better, um, and black people's budgets are, budgets are limited. So, and uh, retrofit is really say. where it matters, isn't it? That we could say new build is inconsequential because it's the retrofit that's going to give us the big energy savings. So, Adam, you were about to say something, and clearly well, you were retrofitted. Yeah, that's right. Well, because of um, you know there are no plots around here, um, and it was the only way to really get to you know. What it was. But I was going to say, as well as you know money uh, constraints, you know we we did a retrofit of, of a flat in Exeter, and you know it, we didn't. It was a modest budget. There wasn't an unlimited amount of money, but there were physical constraints. You know the the, the flat was small. We had to internally insulate because we you know, for various reasons we couldn't externally insulate. We, you know, the rooms couldn't shrink indefinitely, so we had to put, a, you know, 60 millimeters of, of you know, wood fiber insulation, um, and so there are lots of constraints, not just uh, financial ones. But I was going to say, just to address your your devil's advocate point, you know, to me, I think creativity and design flair um, works. You know, often delivers its most amazing results in a situation where there are very great constraints. You know, constraints deliver fantastic ingenuity. Uh, you know, all through human history, you know, Stonehenge was an incredible creative project. You know, the, the constraints that they must have been working under to achieve that were huge. It wasn't very airtight, though, was it? No airtight. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> but, uh, you know, so in a way, you know, all architects have to work within a lot of constraints, whether they call it a passive house or not. And now, you know, energy is becoming a, a more, uh, you know, a tighter constraint than it was in, in a driver. 
of virtually free energy that we had before. So, uh, you know, that, that new constraint or that additional uh, tightening of that constraint it should be driving new creativity and new solutions and new ideas. And, you know, that's quite exciting, I think. I don't see it. it shouldn't be seen as a straitjacket. It should be seen as a, as a, as a driver of, of good design. And Elrond, I'm imagining you must have made that switch at some point in your career. So what was it like going up a gear and thinking everything we do from now on, or maybe not everything, but a lot of what we do is passive house standard? Well, it was a little bit like um, a revelation in a sense. Of, you know, the learning about it was quite kind of, quite a few things challenged what we thought intuitively was what we should be doing. And, you know, that kind of always brings home the lesson that actually we might have some kind of feeling about the right way to do things, but until you actually do the work and actually do the numbers and actually work everything through to the right detail, you don't know for sure if your gut feeling is necessarily right about something like energy and carbon, which are just not easy to kind of visualize or really understand in a kind of intuitive way. Um, so at first, there's quite a few kind of mental obstacles we had to overcome to actually think, do we really want to go down this route? But then once we once we did it, once we took that step and committed to say, right, we're going to, you know, the first two buildings we did simultaneously, two at the same time, we said we're going to do these passive house. At that point, it was kind of like a bit of a relief in a sense because it was, it's A, you've got an identified constraint. You know you work to it, <laughs> which is, you know, we really go along with what Adam's saying about a constraint really fueling creativity in a sense because you just know you've got to work within something. Um, but aside from that, it was just kind of like, you know, it's a change to the whole conversation with the client. It's no longer we're promising you a low energy building, but we don't really know quite how low or what low really means. Actually, we can tell you this is how low it's going to be, and when you have this building finished, it's going to be within a very close margin of what we're predicting. It's not, you know, it's not saying it's absolutely this or absolutely that, but it's within a very close margin. And we knew that we had a lot of certainty around what we were providing, whereas before it was always a bit like. You know, it's a bit like the kind of trying to sell green design, and, and people kind of say, well, what's the kind of value? What does it actually kind of mean? Is it just do I have to put a green roof on, or I do something green? This kind of, it's a bit undefined. Whereas once you start having an actual standard with some actual numbers and some, you know, you can actually start predicting energy costs and things, and you can actually start to talk about comfort in real terms. Because you know, architects like to talk about kind of architecture in kind of quite, quite woolly and quite vague terms sometimes. And green architects are no exception. So once you can actually bring it home to genuine understandable value that the client's going to get out of it that's you know something real then it all becomes much more kind of reassuring in a way so from that point of view you know really good once we got on board with that are there any more arguments that anyone wants to bring up either in favor of passive house or just perhaps if we can reflect on on passive house principles and then i think we'll, we'll wind down and get a, a final comment from uh, each of us I think, just while I'm still talking there, in a sense, just want, there's one thing which I think is really important, which people don't don't always necessarily know the kind of details of, and that that if you if you design a building supposedly all the way through to passive house, but you don't bother with the certification process, so you're just kind of saying I'm doing the principles, so I'm even doing the energy money, all that kind of stuff. There's actually the evidence shows from you know from a lot of monitoring over the years that if you don't go through that certification process, you don't actually have the same reassurance that if you do. And, you know, there's evidence at the last conference shown by um, Dieter Hertz from Germany of, of monitoring of buildings in Austria in that case, showing that those that were certified were maintaining their performance over a you know, considerable number of years after being complete, whereas those that weren't certified, for whatever reason, were just not quite maintaining the same level of performance. So. I think um, it's sort of just sort of really cemented in my mind that if you're going to do the standard, you need to do it properly and go through the whole process because it's just there's so many little so many little things along the way of the design, the construction, all that kind of process where something could fall through the gap, and actually doing something that works means doing everything, not just kind of missing out a few things along the way. Kind of you're on your toes. It keeps you on your toes, you know. If Absolutely. You know that, this third party assessing what you've done, you know, you, 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 any temptation you might have to cut corners is um, is uh, in the out the window. Out the, <laughs> out window. the window which you open in a passage. Out the window. window. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, any final thoughts? Um, no, I think we've said enough. Um, just, um, just maybe on the, I don't know. I just worry about um, getting. Um, 
getting the old housing stock in this country uh, anywhere near passive house standard, anywhere near by 2050. I have no idea how we're going to do it. Mm. Um, and uh, passive house is standard. I love it. Uh, but I don't know. I have a feeling, you know, somehow, I, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to leave it at that. I, I really don't know how we, we're going to do that. Um, but definitely uh, uh, the passive house uh, w way of working, the, the software used, and the accuracy of prediction is just what I love about it. Um, very helpful. I, I agree with Eric about, you know, it's, I can't see how we're going to do it in the UK unless we have the state, you know, saying we're going to have a, a strategic approach, we're going to put all the policy interventions in place to make it happen. Uh, and in the countries where that sort of thing has happened, you know, passive house is becoming the sta you know, is becoming standard. So parts of Switzerland and Austria and southern Germany, you know, effectively de facto, passive house is what people build now. Pretty much, all, you know, um, especially in the public sector. Um, and so, you know, we could do that. We could, if we had the political will and the consistent political will, you know, between, you know, not just for one parliament, but over a, a you know, longer period, you know, consensus between the governing parties. Um, but I think it's very hard without the state's help. You're always struggling, uh, you know, as a, we're a small minority, and you know, we still, I don't know what the, the percentages are now, but certainly, a few years ago, it was over 80 percent, 88 percent, I think, of new bills were, um, you know, are, caught, are built by the big PLCs and retrofitting. You know, in the UK, the concept of retrofitting is is a, of a much more shallow retrofit for most people. You know, uh, in Germany, when you do a retrofit, it's a much more thoroughgoing, deep process. So there's this term "deep retrofit" I've heard used recently. Um, but a lot of people, a renovation means you know replacing a few broken bits of the, of the house, bunging in some double glazed PVC, and slapping on some fresh coat of paint, and bunging in you know a um, you know so a kitchen that's going to last five years and fall apart. And that's a renovation. Well it definitely sounds like we could um, keep on going on about retrofit. We've got yes. more hangouts coming up in future. Does anyone want to give a push to websites or books, Adam, or do you want to start off? Oh, gosh, yes, the book. Well, here's the book. This is the book you need to read. <laughs> not not the one on the top, top shelf of your bookshelf behind you. <laughs> That's right. The copy I happen to have. The Passive House, Passive House Handbook. Um, and then we've got the B&B &B here, which... Uh, for people who are listening to this and watching this who are thinking about doing a project and want to try out a Passive House, um, if you Google Totnes Passive House Bed and Breakfast, um, it's, you know, a lot of our guests find it really, really informative. And, you know, we have a little time to have a chat as well. And um, I, There's nothing like actually trying it out. You can talk about all this the HVP and air tightness until you're blue in the face, but you just need to try it out, I think so. It's very scenic down well, there as well, which is the other thing to, to mention. Uh, Elrond? Um, what was the question, sir? <laughs> well, just if you wanted to plug anything, you don't have to. Uh, straight to uh, Eric. Well, no, if you want to... Um, <laughs> if you want to look at the work that we're involved in, then you can go to the Archetype website, which is just uh, archetype.co.uk. Um, as Ben has kind of uh, promoted a little bit online occasionally, I'm due to start my own blog quite shortly, which is... Spring 2014. Spring, yeah, which is rapidly passing us <laughs> by. <laughs> and um, it could be as early as next week. I might have my oh. website up and live, which will be at elrondmorell.com. And uh, that'll be me blogging in a personal capacity about my uh, feeling about Passive House and other aspects of that in a very uh, straightforward kind of uh, no busy around the way. As well, aren't you, Alan? Sorry? You're a prolific Twitterer as well. Yes, so I'm, on, I'm very busy on Twitter and LinkedIn and Google Plus, so you can find me in all those places. I'm pretty much just generally Alan Burrell anywhere online, you can find me uh, that way. And Eric, finally. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just started. I just put a website up actually called Cold Proof. Uh, I think the name speaks for itself, probably. <laughs> Coldproof.co.uk. Um, just uh, helping people try to do some, uh, figure out what to do with the retrofitting. Um, so that's me. Good stuff. Well, Can it's I been just a great one last thing. Oh, go on, go on. I just want to say that there's a. 
you know, in case there's any potential out there that people feel a bit intimidated by Passivhouse and by the kind of die-hard Passivhouse enthusiast just well, like you. going on, yeah, like me, going on about Passivhouse all the time, and just think, oh, it must be too hard, it must be too expensive, all that kind of thing. I think that I really support what Eric was talking about before: is that it's possible to use the physics and the tools which Passivhouse provides to look at your building. So don't throw your hands up and say, oh, I'm living in a windy old terrace, it's impossible. It mm. is possible if you use the right tools and the right methodology to look at it and actually come up with what a realistic target to do something sensible within whatever your constraints are, whether financial, you know, family circumstances, whatever those constraints might be, is that the tools and, and the people that use the passive house tools and methodology and know what they're talking about about passive house can help anyone in that situation to really take a big step forward. So really people shouldn't feel intimidated or feel like it's a, you've got to do passive house or don't even think about it, just go and stick some PVs on. It's absolutely not the case. There really is a lot of amazing experience and skills available there to help people really push things forward. Yeah. See, he's so passionate that even when I'd actually wound <laughs> everything down, he was suddenly he was back on it again. <laughs> I just want I just to remember, have a little bit of like, quiet, you, quiet, quiet. Um, I want to do a quick plug for a Kickstarter <laughs> campaign that I'm doing. I want to make a documentary about Paul Jennings, the air leakage expert, teaming up with him, and actually Elrond's going to be helping as well. And we're doing really well. We've got around about three and a half thousand pounds aiming for five and a half thousand pounds and a week left so if you can support it in any way head to houseplanninghelp.com forward slash kickstarter thanks everyone thanks yeah thank you bye bye